This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Hugh Ross. He's uh, got a PhD in astrophysics. He's been a pastor for 46 years, and he's the founder of Reason to Believe. So we're super excited to have him here. Um, So you mentioned miracles. Um, So I feel like you pretty much gave an answer to that, but the idea that um, cause I've, I've talked with some people who are like, well, miracles are like incompatible with, with nature because, because of, well, this is where I laws. think the space time theorems, uh, have significance. Okay. I mean, when I run into scientists who say, you know, how can you as, as a scientist and astrophysicist believe in miracles? And I say, well, you know about the space time theorems, what bigger miracle could a scientist ever hope to uh, see? than the coming into existence of all matter, energy, space, and time. I mean, that's the greatest miracle uh, described in the Bible, uh, how God created the universe. It says in Hebrews 11.3, the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. So that's the biggest miracle, at least the biggest scientific miracle Mm -hmm. you could ever hope to uncover. And yet, I don't know of any physicists that would deny the truth of the space-time theorems. We've got over 30 of them today. What they all have in common is there really is a beginning to space and time. And uh, the space, time, matter, and energy had to come from a causal agent uh, that operates beyond space, time, matter, and energy. I mean, I remember speaking at a NASA research facility where the director said, this is a government institution. You're not allowed to use the word God here. And I said, well, I don't see that in the Constitution. But hey, he was the boss, and I said, well, okay, if I can't use the word God, is it okay if I refer to the causal agent beyond space and time that created the universe and designed it uh, for the benefit of life and human being? <laughs> he said, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> it's just much simpler to say God. <laughs> it's just a little shorter. <laughs> well, I like that because now I ha- actually gave the audience a definition of God. Mm. I never used the word God, but I gave them a good definition. Yeah, that's really cool. So what would you say to someone who, like a lay person like myself, who's not super scientific, but has heard that there's discrepancy between faith and science, what is a stepping stone of um, breaking down that, that barrier? And maybe it's, it's um, you know, resources well, you have put together. One thing I noted about the Bible that set it apart from all the other holy books, it was the only holy book I picked up that commanded objective testing. Mm. First Thessalonians 5.21. Everything must be tested. Hold fast to that which proves to be good. Mm. And so, to me, that's biblical faith. You don't have faith unless you make some effort to establish that it's true. Mm. But you also lack faith if you don't act upon what you know to be true. Mm. So if it proves to be true and good, you need to embrace it and uh, you know, accept it and uh, you know, live your life accordingly. Yeah, I think it's easy to cross those wires and that definition and think, well, faith is acting on something you don't know to be true. And that's it. Like that's, you know, and you're kind of, you're, you're removing this firm foundation of, well, no, it is based on things that are verifiable, testable. That's what scripture says to do. Um, and then from that, there is this reaching into what hasn't, you know, faith is the assurance of things not seen. So there is this element of like, oh, this isn't literally, I can see, but it's, it's still rooted, you know. But I think, I wonder if the definition of faith is what causes so much, you know, vexation between... Well, there are three Hebrew words that are used for faith in the Old Testament. Uh-huh. And you've got the Greek word pistis in the New Testament. But they all have as a definition, acting upon what you know to be true. Mm. So, okay. now I know a lot of scientists... <clears throat> that accept that there must be an agent beyond space and time that created everything, but they don't act upon that. Mm -hmm. They still live their lives as if such a God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So they got one component, but they don't have the second component. And then I've run into Christians who don't bother to establish whether or not it's true. Mm -hmm. So they're engaging in a blind faith. And it's like, the Bible never sustains blind faith. It actually condemns it, so. Mm. Acting on what you know to be true. That's a really yeah. helpful definition of faith. And yeah, that's really good. And even me as someone who's grown up 
in the church and use the word faith and has faith like that's there's something relieving about that because there there does feel sometimes a pressure that i need to just will my you know i need to control my will to like hope that this is accurate you know or or a fearfulness to tell someone who's who's like hey i don't know if this is true you know a fearfulness to say well test it like you know you don't need to like that's okay. You don't know. You should just buy into it. It's like, no, you should, you should test and see. And even, even as you know, scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Like he, there's an invitation to test and explore. Well, I think we need to bring that more into the church. Mm. I mean, the biggest complaint I hear from people outside the church, uh, is, Hey, church is a place where somebody preaches a sermon and then you walk out. There's no opportunity to engage, no opportunity for questions, no opportunity to debate, no opportunity to challenge what's been said. And uh, churches I know that actually build that into their mission, we're going to make room uh, for doubt. We're going to make room for questions and debate. And uh, every sermon is followed by a Q&A session. Wow. And we're not going to screen the questions. We take them live from the floor. Those are churches that are growing by adult converts. Because, mm. uh, you know, people, I mean, it's actually following that biblical principle. We're going to put things to the test. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what you hear, you don't think it's true. We're going to test it. Yeah. And uh, I've never heard of a church doing that. That's awesome, though. That's really cool. So uh, is that what it usually looks like to... Is it just question and answer after the service type thing? What are other ways that churches? Well, I've that? been running a class for skeptics in our church for uh, 46 years now. Okay. And it's like, yes, there is teaching that runs for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. but it's followed by an hour of Q&A and debate. Mm. And so, and, you know, we take on, we do have a rule, though, no softball questions. Mm. It's got to be hardball questions. Yeah. So... That's cool. Were, I mean, when that started, were there ever any questions that you just had to be like, I don't, I don't know, or we're going to have to revisit? How, or do well, you still course. get those? I mean, uh, that, that's how you grow your faith. I mean, you hear a question, you hear it and say, gee, I don't have a good answer for that. But I'm going to try to find a good answer. Yeah. So you can say, hey, how about uh, we get back to this? Or you assign a project. I remember a couple of atheist uh, scientists came into our skeptics class and they raised an issue. I knew the answer, but I said, you know what, you asked a really good question. Here are some things you can read uh, on that point. How about if you come back next week and report to our class what you discovered? Mm. And if you got questions that you want to throw to the class, bring them to the class and throw them out. Yeah. Uh, but then I also had some Christians in the class saying, I want you to do the same homework they're doing. Yeah. So. That's really cool. That makes me, my mind just went to... Um, just Jacob wrestling with God and, and how God calls <laughs> his people. He um, gives them the name Israel. He's like, your name is wrestles with God. And I think in the church, there can be this fear of that wrestling of like, no, you just have to be just, it should look this way. It shouldn't look well, like you're struggling. You know, God knows every thought. So if he sees that you've got doubts, you're not hiding that from God. Yeah. He knows. And he referred to King David as a man after my own heart. And if you read the Psalms of David, he spewed out his problems, his yeah. questions, sometimes with a lot of emotion. Yeah. Uh, but when he did that, God was able to get through to him. Yeah. And then I tell people to sometimes God wants you to be patient. Mm. You know, if you don't get the answer right away, it doesn't mean an answer is not coming. Mm. God might be just sharing with you, hey, you need to really study this. And uh, so, you know, do do your work, and you will get answers. Yeah, I've that reminds me. I've I've talked with some friends of mine who have been in places where they're, um, like, I've I've had I've had several conversations with friends who are just very genuinely, from what I can tell, want to believe, and are interested in researching and and have researched any number of resources and from people who are opposed to, you know, what the Bible says, people who are, you know, or they grew up in the church and are now kind of exploring. But I've had several times where there's been this interesting moment of, I really, like, I'm, I'm talking with them about this kind of just deep wrestling and I'm, and my impression is they really want to believe this. Like, they're like, they're not just saying that for me because they know that's what I think. It's, there's this like, I really want this to be true. I really want 
to be just assured in this. I want, you know, to come to rest. Like, and what, what, you know, have you interacted with people in that place? Have you, what is your well, advice? There's been? basically telling you, I want the facts, mm. you know, so yeah, I'm not opposed to what you're saying, uh, but give me the evidence. Mm. I want to see the evidence. Yeah. So, and then you say, well, yeah, let's, let's actually sit down and go through all this. Mm. So, I remember engaging a, a particle physicist at Caltech, and uh, we spent three hours uh, over coffee, and he just had all these questions that he had. So uh, it wasn't that he was objecting to the Christian faith, but he says, hey, if I'm gonna believe, I gotta have answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. And something else I've shared with people in our congregation is that when you're dealing with an adult, particularly someone who's a scientist, an engineer, or a technologist, they're going to uh, behave uh, most uh, vociferously at the point of conversion mm -hmm. because they're at the point where they're saying, you know, I really want to give my life to Christ, but I know if I do, I'm going to get all these objections from my friends. Mm -hmm. And what I've often seen is that they will role play not only the questions they anticipate from their friends, they'll even role play the demeanor they're gonna get from their friends. Mm -hmm. So when you see the demeanor of the non-Christian changing and becoming more hostile, recognize, I think they're role playing what they're gonna to have to face mm -hmm. if they give their life to Christ. Yeah. And so that's why it tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, be prepared with good reasons for your faith and hope in Christ, but with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. Mm -hmm. So no matter what hostility you face, maintain that gentle, respectful spirit and be sure to come up with reasons. Not the reasons that are good for you, it needs to be the reasons that are good for the person you're talking to. So yeah, I may have adequate reasons to give my faith in Christ, but he may have different things that he needs. So I need to be prepared to give him or her the reasons that are most significant. and. Uh, and it takes time. Yeah. So, you know, uh, what I've noticed with uh, people who've been raised in an atheist home and have not read the Bible is that on meeting Christians and asking questions, it could take two, three, four, or five years. Mm. Uh, and it was like that with me. It took me two years of study mm. before I could give my life to Christ. Mainly, I was thinking about all the professors and students and all the objections that they would have. So I wanted to be prepared to deal with that before yeah. giving my life to Christ. Yeah. And I'm not alone. <coughs> yeah. No, I bet. That makes sense. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So you said... Yeah, excuse me, too. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. <coughs> <coughs> we can take a pause for a second. They've got the uh, high school retreats leaving today, so that's what all, all that right. is. <laughs> okay. But, um, <clears throat> so they're coming back or leaving? They're leaving, they're yeah. Leaving. I'm actually, after this, I'm going to go join them. So <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, so, so you talked about, um, obviously, you know, science being, being a big part. Did you always know you wanted to do science? Was that like, you know, like astrophysics and... Well, my parents said that when, from the age of two onwards, I was doing experiments. Yeah. Sometimes experiments they didn't want me to do. Uh huh. Uh, but from the age of uh, eight onwards, I knew my future career would be astrophysics. Mm. And it was at age seven that I really got interested in astronomy. Okay. Wow. So my parents said I was obsessive because all I was studying was physics and astronomy. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's but it was something I really enjoyed. I still do. Yeah. And so when. When did those, the crossroads of your faith and astronomy really hit? I mean, obviously when you became a believer, but when was it immediate that you paired those things together as these are completely united in my role and my walk and what I'm going to do with my life? Or? Well, I mean, the Bible was the last of the religious holy books I picked up. Mm -hmm. But when I picked it up, I went through the first page and says, wow, Everything stated here is in the correct order and it's correctly described. And everything is so specifically stated. Uh, this book has a possibility mm. of being a revelation from the creator of the universe. I'm going to give this serious study. Mm. And I knew my family would not approve. Mm. 
So, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of homework for my uh, university studies. But come midnight, when the rest of the family was asleep, I would open up my Gideon Bible and begin to read it and study it. So usually from midnight to about 1.30 in the morning, I was studying my Bible. But it was all done in secret. Uh, And I did that for an 18-month period. And did you just read kind of cover to cover? I read cover to cover. Wow. And uh, I tested everything I could find. So Mm. whatever made some statement of history, geography, or science, Mm. I would put the Bible down and say, okay, is that true or is it not true? I'd Mm. hollow textbooks, uh, look at the scientific literature. So it took me 18 months to get to Revelation 22. Yeah. Wow. What were some of the more surprising... Um, so you said you were testing things. Like, what were some of the claims that you were like, oh, I wonder if this is true, but you found out it was? What were some of the more surprising claims as you went through? Well, seeing uh, what it said about the constancy of the laws of physics, I says, well, that's something that scientists are still checking out. Mm. Uh, and then I, one of the things I read Genesis chapter 1, where it says Earth began as a water world. And all the geology textbooks said the continents have always been here. Uh, But I had the opportunity in my sophomore physics year to take a course uh, from two of the three physicists that launched the discipline of plate tectonics. Mm. It was actually the first course ever taught on plate tectonics. So I managed to get into the class. I was a bunch of graduate students and myself as an undergrad. And uh, I remember talking to the professors and saying, well, what I'm understanding is that plate tectonics means that there's growth in the continents. They cover more and more of the surface of the Earth. And the graph you showed uh, showed the uh, continents starting off at about 5 to 8% of the surface of the Earth. Mm. Is it possible it starts off as zero? And he says, yeah, I think it's anywhere between zero and 10%. Wow. We don't know. Uh, but we do know that the uh, continental coverage of the earth gets greater and greater with respect to time. Mm. Uh, So I was not yet a Christian, Mm. but I said, okay, maybe what Genesis is saying is actually correct. Mm. I wonder how this is going to play out. Well, about a decade later, and this is after I'd become a Christian, papers were published saying, hey, earth really does begin as a water world. Uh, We get a few volcanic islands early, then we get a couple of small cratons, and then continents later. And uh, the latest paper was published in 20, yeah, 2018, mm. which basically says that uh, almost all the continental growth uh, took place when the universe or the Earth was 2.2 billion years old. Mm. That's a little bit less than half of its present age. Mm. Genesis puts it at the beginning of creation day three. So a little bit less than halfway through the creation story. So mm. it says, hey, the timing's right. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. So the days, what do you, because I've heard people say, you know, well, if it's, if it's I mean, because that's obviously the literal seven day versus um, old earth, you know, what, what, what do you, is the day just a, a word picture of time? Well, I was not raised in the church. I didn't get exposed to any of these interpretations. Mm-hmm. I picked up uh, the Gideon Bible, looked at Genesis 1, and said, okay, uh, this word day must have at least three distinct literal definitions, Mm -hmm. because three are used on the first page. Mm -hmm. Because on creation day one, it's using the word day for the daylight hours. Mm -hmm. On creation day four, it's using the word day for a 24-hour period. Mm -hmm. It's contrasting seasons, days, and years. Mm -hmm. But in Genesis 2-4, it uses the same word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. Mm. So that's day is a significant passage of time. Mm. The other thing I notice is you've got an evening and a morning uh, phrase at the end of each creation day, Mm. but not at the end of day seven. And day seven, there's no evening morning phrase. Mm. And I said, well, I don't know what this evening morning means in the original language, but at a minimum it's telling me each of these days has a start time and an end time. The lack of the evening morning phrase for the seventh day told me we're still in God's seventh day. Mm. And Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 explicitly state that we're still in God's seventh day. 
live your lives in such a way that you'll be worthy to enter into God's seventh day. Mm. So the seventh day is ongoing. Mm. And what really sealed it for me is it says for six days God creates. On the seventh day, he ceases from his work of creation. Mm. And uh, I told you earlier, my parents were concerned I was being obsessive about my studies in physics and astronomy. Mm. When I was 11 years of age, they bought our family a big thick book in evolutionary biology, mm. trying to encourage me to read something besides physics and astronomy. Uh-huh. I was the only one in the family that read the book, yeah. <laughs> but I remember telling my parents, the numbers don't work. Mm. We have all these uh, classes and orders and phyla of life appearing before humanity and none whatsoever after humanity. Mm. When I picked up the Bible, it answered the fossil record enigma why we see it before humanity and we don't see it after humanity. For six days God creates. That explains all the new phyla and classes and orders and families of life. On creation day seven, God stops creating. Mm. So it explains why in the human era we see zero evidence for the appearance of new families, Mm. uh, classes, uh, orders, and phyla. Okay. So the the God resting, like... Because when, remind me which day man is created, is that? While God creates Adam and Eve at the end of creation day six, Mm -hmm. God's last act of creation was the creation of Eve. Mm -hmm. So in the human era, uh, we see no evidence of God creating new species of life or new phyla classes, whatever. That also explains to me why so many astronomers are believers and so few biologists are. 95% plus of biologists do their research on the seventh day. And so they say, we see no evidence for the supernatural handiwork of God in nature. Well, for good reason. God's resting from that. Mm. Whereas astronomers will say, we see evidence everywhere. Because in astronomy, it takes time for light to travel from stars and galaxies to our telescope. So almost all our data comes from the six days. So we see the evidence everywhere, whereas for most biologists, all their data comes from day seven. Interesting. And they say, we don't see it. Yeah. Well, they're looking on the wrong day. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Whereas a paleontologist, which are looking deep in time, they say, wow, we look at the Cambrian explosion, the phyla all show up before the species show up. Mm. They show up simultaneously. They show up immediately. This is the opposite of what we'd expect from a naturalistic perspective. Because mm. wow. naturalism would say you get the proliferation of species, and if you wait long enough, that'll generate new genera. Mm. If you wait even longer, new families, uh, new uh, orders, new classes, and last of all, new phyla. Mm-hmm. You look at the Avalon and Cameron explosions, you see the exact opposite. Mm. The phyla show up first. Wow. The species show up last. And all the phyla show up simultaneously. They're not progressed over a period of time. They're all there at the beginning. Wow. And they're all there when oxygen allows them to be there. I was telling you earlier how the oxygen content uh, went from less than 1% up to 8%. Mm-hmm. And that made the atmosphere transparent. That happened in what's called the Great Unconformity, uh, a worldwide geological event where you have these huge landslides coming off the continents and going into the oceans. Mm. That caused oxygen to jump up very suddenly. Mm. But the moment oxygen reaches 8%, you immediately have animals. Mm. There's no time delay. They show up at the very moment the oxygen permits their existence. And all the phyla that can tolerate 8% show up. Mm. Cameron explosion, oxygen jumps up to 10%. Uh, but at the moment it is 10%, uh, all the phyla we see on the planet today are present there at the beginning of the Cameron mm. explosion. Man, that's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> that's insane. What is one scientific, I know that's a really broad question, but what is one like scientific development discovery that's recent that you are really astounded by and how it connects to your faith and and how it demonstrates who God is. Well, I spoke on that at uh, George Mason last night uh, to an audience of students and faculty there. 
basically saying there is a discovery made about a year ago um, that I see as utterly miraculous mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, we're looking at how did the moon form? And for decades, astronomers had no clue. Mm -hmm. We now have an answer. The solar system began with five rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Thea. Mm -hmm. The planet Thea collided with the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. It made the Earth bigger than what it was, but it also formed a huge debris cloud around the Earth, mm -hmm. which coalesced to make the moon. Uh, but because you had these two planets colliding with one another, it resulted in Earth having a really hot liquid iron core. Likewise, the Moon having a really hot liquid iron core. Mm. And both bodies were close together, so close together that the gravity exerted by the Moon on the Earth was stronger on the near side of the Earth than the far side of the Earth, which caused the liquid iron in the core of the Earth to circulate. And when you circulate liquid iron, you generate a magnetic field. Same thing happened in the moon. Uh, Earth's gravity on the near side of the moon was much stronger than the far side. So it caused the liquid iron inside the moon's core to circulate. And because of how close the two planets were to one another, the magnetic fields coupled. Mm. So you had this powerful coupled magnetosphere. And that existed for the first 560 million years of the Earth-Moon system. Mm. But that was the same time when the sun was pouring out particle radiation and X-ray and gamma-ray radiation and flaring activity that was 100,000 times greater than what the sun is emitting today. Mm. And if it wasn't for that coupled magnetosphere, the sun's radiation would have sputtered away all of Earth's water and all of Earth's atmosphere mm. and there'd be no life on planet Earth. And the scientists who published this, they concluded their paper saying, we think this is another habitability requirement. Mm -hmm. A rather modest statement because <laughs> what really is implied by the research is there's no possibility even for microbial life unless you have a planet-moon system with the exact origin mm -hmm. of the Earth-moon system and the exact subsequent history have to have the Earth to be the size it is with the composition it has, likewise the Moon, having just the right distance, having that hot origin as a result of two rocky planets colliding with one another. If all that's in place, there's no possibility for life of any kind uh, at any time on that planet. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, so, well, what was interesting is even before this paper was published, there was a group of six scientists who were developing models to explain the origin of the moon. Mm -hmm. And you know, having these two bodies collide with one another, they have to collide at just the right velocity, mm -hmm. at just the right time to explain why the Earth has its features, the moon has its features, so that life can exist. And the six said, we've got way too much design here. Mm -hmm. We need to redo the models and find some way to lower the level of design. Mm. They redid all the models and they came up with exponentially greater design than what they began with. Wow. And one of the researchers, and this is all published in the British journal Nature, mm. and one of them had a, a little essay that he wrote, Tim Elliott, and he said, all this required fine tuning is causing us philosophical disquiet. Wow. It's basically implying there has to be a creator. Yeah, that's fascinating. And even just even that process of, hold on, this is starting to look like, you know, design, and then reevaluating and, yeah. Well, that was in 2014. Yeah. And now we have 2020 and 2021, mm. where the level of design in the Earth-Moon system is exponentially greater than what we thought in 2013 and 2014. Wow. That's crazy. So there's even more philosophical disquiet now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to put it lightly. <laughs> Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hugh Ross. Or you said I just call you Hugh. Yeah. Um, is there anything you want to add, anything <clears throat> we, we didn't cover that you'd like to just close with? You know, I can close with this. Uh, when you read the Bible, it states in multiple places that God began his works of redemption before he created anything at all. 
the grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. That's uh, you know, First, uh, Second Timothy one nine. The hope that we share in Jesus Christ was given to us before the beginning of time. Titus one two. There's several other examples I can give you, but what that implies is that everything that God creates is for the purpose of redemption. And what I've been sharing with my secular peers, look, I know you're not a believer, but if you'll do your scientific research from a biblical redemptive perspective, where God designs the universe, earth and earth's life, so that billions of human beings can be redeemed from their sin and evil, it will make you a more successful scientist. Put this to the test and see if it doesn't make you a better scientist. Mm. And if it does, maybe you need to check out the Bible. Mm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I think we'll end there. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for tuning in. To hear more, go to digdeeperdc.com.